Hey guys, so this video we're going to talk about two of the main reasons why the Dust Bowl happened, and that is drought, number one, and then number two, the winds, the heavy winds that happen. So both of these two first-person accounts that we're going to look through talk about it happening as it's happening. So many people didn't really understand why the Dust Bowl was happening. They've been farming you know, for hundreds of years in this area, and now all of a sudden it became a problem, and so now they're trying to figure out why. And so the Henderson letter that we're going to read first talks about the drought and what it caused what they think caused the Dust Bowl, and then the Savita uh, account, the second one we're going to look at, is talking about the heavy winds and why they think that was the main reason um, for the Dust Bowl occurring. So the Henderson letter is this first one we're going to read, and this is Caroline Henderson's letter to Henry A. Wallace, sent July 22, 1935. Yet common sense suggests that the regions which are no longer entirely self-supporting cannot rely indefinitely upon government aid. So what's it saying in that first paragraph is these areas that were affected by the Dust Bowl that we talked about in yesterday's video, they used to be self-supporting. They could make their own food. They didn't have to rely on anybody else or outside people. Now they do. And they're saying that they can't indefinitely rely upon government aid because there's not enough. And eventually it's going to run out. So the problem remains, and the one satisfactory solution is beyond human control. Some of our neighbors with small children fearing the effects upon their health have left temporarily until it rains. And that's the drought. This is where Henderson is talking to Wallace and saying that the drought, the rain, is the problem. Others have left permanently, thinking doubtless that nothing could be worse. Thus far, we, we and most of our friends seem held, for better or worse, by memory and hope. So what they're saying is many of their neighbors are, are staying around because they feel like eventually it's going to get back to how it was and it's going to get back to better times, hoping and remembering what it used to be like. I can look backward and see our covered wagon drawn up by the door of the cabin in the early light of the May morning long ago, can feel again the sweet, fresh breath of the untrodden prairie, and recall for a moment the proud confidence of our youth. So what she's saying, she's looking back in her memory and seeing this time when it was better, and how they were so confident that they were doing the right thing and they were going to be successful. But when I try and see the wagon or the Model T truck headed in the opposite direction away from our home, and all our cherished hopes, I cannot see it at all. So now she's saying that it's been so long, about five years since the Dust Bowl started at this point, that it's getting harder and harder to remember what that time was like. Perhaps it's only because the dust is too dense and blinding. And so she's saying that it's getting hard to remember, it's getting hard to um, really see that light at the end of the tunnel that eventually will get back to normal and be better um, for. And this is the Henderson letter, like I said, blaming the drought, the lack of water happening uh, is what caused the Dust Bowl. So now our next one that we're going to look at is the Vida um, account. It was uh, Lawrence Savita is farming the Dust Bowl. This is from a book that he wrote, a first-hand account from Kansas. Um, it was first published in 1940, so after the Dust Bowl happened, this book was published. Most of my remaining wheat fell an easy prey to the first gales of February. Gales is another word for wind. And none of the wheat that was up in the region could long withstand the succeeding gales, which first chopped off the plants even with the ground, or even with the ground, then proceeded to take the roots out. And so they're saying the wind was so heavy that it took the plant out completely out of the ground uh, and obviously killed their crop. And so in the Henderson letter, they were talking about water and lack of water, drought being the problem. So Vito is talking about these heavy winds and how it killed most of his crops and it even took out the roots. They did not stop there. They blew away the rich topsoil, leaving the subsoil exposed. So the topsoil is the nutrient rich. That's why he's called the rich topsoil. That's where the plants grow, and it blew that away, leaving the subsoil exposed, and then kept sweeping away at the hard pan, which is almost as hard as concrete. And so when you look at soil, you have the topsoil, you have subsoil below that that still is, has some nutrients, but not as much. And then below that is usually a really hard layer of, of really hard packed dirt, and that's why it's called a hard pan. And so they blew the topsoil, the subsoil, and then down to that hard pan where you can't really even dig in, let alone try and grow something in. And like they said, it's like concrete. This was something new and different from anything I had ever experienced before, a destroying force beyond my wildest imaginings. So they're saying they'd never experienced winds like these before. When some of my own fields started blowing, I was utterly bewildered, meaning he couldn't do anything about it, he didn't know what to do. I took counsel with some of my neighbors who had, had great, greater experience, 
but received little in the way of encouragement. According to their information, there was little hope of saving a crop once they had started the, the land had started blowing, and the only method of checking the movement of the soil was the practice of strip listing. This meant running deep parallel furrows, 20 and 30 feet apart in the east and west directions across the path of the prevailing winds. So essentially they dig a huge amount of dirt um, and hope that that d dirt wall would block their crops. This tends to check the force of the wind along the ground and allow the fine silt like dust to fall into the open furrows. And so they would make these big um, wall-like structures and then have the sand fall into the the hole in, on either side of it to make it so it wouldn't destroy their crops. And so what you're going to do with this information is you're going to be coming up with hypotheses every day and every time you hear about a new reason of why you think the dust will happen, you're going to add that to your hypothesis. Have a good rest of your day, guys. Bye.